When Jesus stepped onto this earth, he spelt out that one word, love. It's why God created us. It's why we worship. It's what we're made for, what we're meant to discover. Everything the word of God says, all of its instructions, comes from a place called love. Say.
I've been faithful and I've been reckless at every bend I've held everything together and watched it shatter I've stood tall and I have crumbled in the same breath I have wrestled and I have trembled towards surrender Chase my heart adrift and drift it home again Plundered blessing till I've been desperate to find redemption And every time I turn around, Lord, you're still there I was found before I
this kind of love Somehow This kind of love is who you are It's a grace I can never add up To be somebody you still want Somehow You love me as you find Westside, a new year is upon us and our January menu is in motion. Here's a look at a few of the highlights. For the big read, we're encouraging you to purchase Rick Viota's book, The Deeply Formed Life, and we'll read it together by June of this year. Also, our tradition of our ghost seminar is back and Jerry Fitch and David Harvey will be tackling Zoom both Monday, January 18th and the 25th for a two-part seminar. Make sure to register at wkc.org menu. Also, women, join Kristen on Zoom Thursday mornings at 9.30 for a one-hour devotional time. Beginning January 14th, we will dive into a five-week study from Right Now Media entitled Woven. For a full list of everything in January, go to wkc.org menu. And don't forget to like and subscribe us. Now, David's back to kick off our new series based on the Deeply Formed Life book. Jesus once told a story about two builders. It goes like this in Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Now, we are being formed by social media. This has been true for a long time, regardless of our age. Our news, our views, our perspectives, our dreams, our politics, our desired, are being shaped through YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. But this kind of went into hyperdrive in 2020, while we spent unprecedented amount of of our time digitally connected, which is a problem for us. Because social media is shallow. Like, you know this already. Think about what you saw last year. 2020 was like a titanic of years. We all went into the new decade hopeful and excited, and with a matter of days, the whole world steamed headfirst into a pandemic. Yet no matter what was going on, everyone online continued to post food pictures, family photos, and holiday shots. Even when we all knew that we were all struggling, we still curated a public image of ourselves that looked content, joyful, and successful. While professionals told us about the crumbling state of our mental health, apparently no one told Instagram. And of course, we know that our social profile is barely 10% of our authentic reality, yet so much of our lives are validated by what we see and show online. So has our social media society discipled us into superficiality? 
When we peel away the filtered photographs, smiling selfies, and carefully curated images, do we find joyful, content, successful people? Or do we find the real humanity of persons wrestling with rage, marital failure, financial stress, addictions, shame, suicidal thoughts? And this question matters, you see, because as Jesus' wisdom teaches, it's not what you see that brings everything crashing down. It's what you can't see. It's the foundations. And that's what I want to talk about in this new six-part series called Deep. The superficiality of our society has begun to inform our understanding of following Jesus. Christians and churches have begun to embrace the superficiality and have found it increasingly difficult to navigate the realities of life in our culture. And this superficiality affects the church across a broad spectrum. You, you see it everywhere. Conservative traditions that value right theological thinking but are resistant to the inner transformation Christ wants to work in us. Or progressive Christianities that emphasize societal transformation but without the pursuit of Jesus. Pentecostals and Charismatics who want the right experience but are uncommitted to the patient work of loving well and growing in Christ. So this series is unapologetically formed by this book by Rich Viodas called The Deeply Formed Life. I want to encourage you to get a copy of this book and participate in our Big Read project by reading it before June. It hopefully, along with this series, will help you in your devotional life to put into practice some values that will help you grow, not at a superficial level, but deeply. And as we as a church are all reading this book together, then we will learn and grow together with one another. Now, Jesus says it really clearly in our parable, if we listen to it carefully. What something looks like, the house bit, what you can see, isn't the story that you should pay attention to. And that's a lesson that we should not just move on from quickly. What you see isn't the story you should pay attention to. As far as we know, the two houses in the parable are identical in everything except their depth. But it was in what we couldn't see that the problems were hidden. Like our contemporary culture so values accomplishments possessions, wealth, intelligence, and gifting, that we really, really want to believe that we can build our whole lives on these things alone. The curse that many of us live under is that we then try to do this. And in doing so, we sidestep the slow, deep, unseen work of character formation. Just before midnight of April 14th, 1912, the unsinkable ship, the RMS Titanic, took a glancing blow on her starboard side from a North Atlantic iceberg. For just seven seconds, an unseen underwater spur of ice from that berg ripped through the metal hull of the boat, creating what amounted to a mass of one square meter's worth of holes below the waterline. The net result was the deaths of over 1,500 people. Like a comparatively small amount of damage, just a, a, a meter square in total. Seven seconds of impact from an unseen underwater spur of ice. Terrifyingly, like no one saw the bit of the iceberg that sunk the Titanic. Many of the passengers didn't even realize the boat was sinking for the first hour afterwards. Like it's said that generally, you only see around 10% of the mass of an iceberg above the water. Yet it's the 90% below the water line that sinks the ship. What's true of Jesus' parable, we now see reflected in nature. That it's what goes on underneath that gets us in trouble. Unfortunately, recent church history has been a roll call of Christians forgetting this parable. Far too many times we hear of pastors and Christians being exposed in immoral and unethical behavior. And rarely, 
if ever, is the problem that their giftings or abilities or effectiveness has, has gone away, but rather a neglect of the deep, unseen areas of life that Jesus wants to transform in us. So what I want to suggest at the beginning of our series is that following Jesus is an invitation to think about your whole life. The bit of the iceberg above the water, but the majority of it below the water too. But there's also a change in how we think in all of that as well. Our schooling in superficiality has led us to believe that if we change the outside, the visible bit, that will affect the hidden, the inside as well. But in many of his letters in the Bible, St. Paul considers this very thing and answers it with a resounding no. Transformation, Paul will tell us, doesn't work outside in, it only works inside out. So while many in early Christianity believed that if you performed certain rituals and looked certain ways, this would give you the right Christian form. But Paul told the Galatians, in chapter 4 and verse 19, that what they were actually looking for is that Christ be formed in them. As Viodas says in his book, what use is superficial change if we neglect the deep work that Jesus wants to do in us? So don't sacrifice being deeply formed to settle for being superficially shaped. But deep formation, however, isn't a quick business. Quick is the currency of the shallow. So as you engage with this new series, and, and hopefully this book, what you're looking for is long-term growth in depth and maturity. Over the next five teachings, we're going to be exploring the following areas. Number one, we're going to look at contemplative rhythms for an exhausted life. The pace that we live our life at is frankly damaging to our relationship with God. So is it possible for us in the 21st century to trade nonstop for something deeper and transformative? We're also going to look at racial reconciliation for a divided world. Like, can we walk a path to something more representative of how Jesus imagines the world and the church to be? Thirdly, we're going to talk about interior examination for a world that lives on the surface. Like, do we actually know how to make sense of our inner life? Like, does our unawareness of what's actually going on in ourselves hinder our growth in all of our relationships, not just with God, but with others as well? Another thing we're going to talk about in this series is sexual wholeness for a culture that splits body from spirit. Like, would we even know what it looks like to integrate our whole being, spiritually and physically? How can we navigate our lives in a way that causes flourishing in our lives and relationships? And finally, the fifth thing we'll talk about in this series is missional presence for a distracted and disengaged people. Like, do you actually have space in your life for others? Do any of us? Is it possible to engage the difficult subjects of our world, poverty, injustice, with a healing and hopeful presence? Now, the plan for this series is that each week we'll consider one of these subjects and then some ways in which we can grow more deeply in these areas. As we go through each of the subjects, we'll be informed a lot by Veodasi's book and other sources, but you can read more and do your own study to dive deeper into these subjects. But let's get back to the builders for a little bit more. Jesus begins our parable today with this statement, why do you call me Lord, but don't do what I say? Like a, a deeply formed disciple of Jesus will change their priorities and move away from what the writer David Brooks calls the big me culture. Brooks notes that a recent move amongst Western society has been to consistently position ourselves at the center of the universe. In 1954, 10,000 adolescents were asked if they considered themselves a very important person. 12% of those 10,000 said yes. 
they did consider themselves a very important person. The same question was asked to a, to a similar sized group of adolescents in 1989, by which point nearly 80% said yes, they think of themselves as a very important person. Psychologists have something that they call a narcissism test. And the median score in this narcissism test across our populations has risen by 30% in the last two decades. Like we are more and more narcissistic as a people. And this is hardly surprising because the message is everywhere. You are special. Trust yourself. Follow your own truth. From commencement speeches to Disney movies, we are bathed in a constantly in a message that Brooks calls a gospel of self-trust. From self-help guides, Pixar characters, and even some preachers, we hear a message of our own brilliance. And of course, we spend hours of every day scrolling through the various big me social media apps that constantly reflect our own importance back to ourselves. And then there's Jesus. And Jesus has the audacity and offensiveness to suggest that we listen to him and do what he says. But what if the path to a deeply formed life begins by accepting that the truth we listen to is Jesus and not ourselves? So the deep life requires a humility of us, a willingness to step away from a societal standard that says you're always right and invites us to contemplate the ways that Jesus encourages us to live. And to some extent, 2020 will have been a good guide as to how you're doing in all this. Jesus says in his parable, well, he talks about how the storm exposes the foundational state of the builder's homes. As the floodwaters crash against it, we find out how deep or shallow the foundations are. As 2020 crashed into you, there was an unprecedented opportunity to see how your approach to life was working for you. Did the Pixar doctrine of self-belief sustain you? Or do you need something deeper to anchor you? If you're not sure, ask your friends and loved ones. Were you happier, kinder, and calmer in 2020? Or more stressed, angry, grumpy, and emotional? Jesus reminds us in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 16 that you know the tree by the fruit. Good fruit tells of a good tree. As he puts it, you don't get grapes from thorns. Humiliatingly, our attitudes and behaviors say everything about our foundations, our roots, what's below the surface of the iceberg. It's all there. We just don't want it to be true. Who you are when you're squeezed, that's who you are. But I fundamentally believe that the deep transformation of obeying Jesus can change that. Okay, one more tiny little point of detail, and then we're done. I want to offer a house-building disclaimer. If you go back to the text of the parable, notice two little words in verse 48. Like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. Did you see them? On rock. This isn't just about any old foundations. This isn't that one man just tried harder than the other. It's what he chose to build on. Like due to the geological features of the area, builders in Jesus' time, if they wanted the property to last, had to do the hard work of digging through a layer of sandy clay to find bedrock to build their house on. But during the hot summer months, it was often tempting to just build the house on the seemingly tough clay base a clay base that became anything other than tough when the wet season rolled in later in the year. So what mattered wasn't simply the hard work, it was the quality of the foundation chosen. And this is an important caveat for us as we begin a series about Christian discipleship. In fact, as we look at that, as we go through our year, we must remember this. Calls for us to grow and find a deeper life can easily become prey to all the same problems we identified with Instagram earlier. 
The demand to transform can lead to a striving to transform, a need to reach the standard of transformation, the desire to prove that we have transformed enough. And this leads, well, this leads to a constant stepping on the scales to see if we've achieved it, rather than a genuine desire to have Christ form us, as Paul said to the Galatians. Your plant will never grow if you keep digging it up to prove that it's growing. But this transformation that Jesus talks about is built on him, on rock. So again, don't be surprised. It's a transformation formed by grace and not your achievement. As David Zahl says, Christianity loses its animating potency when thou shall transform becomes the imperative du jour. No different in impact from the edicts we receive via every other area of life. Anxiety, narcissism, loneliness, and despair. However, if we can remember that genuine transformation is the fruit of grace and not what you do in order to get grace, well, then it isn't a scale or a metric or a data point to measure you by and rank you against a standard. A deeply formed life isn't religious people partaking in a superficial process to help them be better at being good. The invitation to build your foundation upon the rock that is Jesus is the invitation to join real people coping with their constant failure to be good. We build our foundations deep on the rock, not because we think we're great builders who can, withstorm, who can withstand the storm, but rather because we know we're not good builders and only the rock will keep us together. So this is what we want to focus on for our first series of 2021. Get the book, spend the next few months reading it, and put it into practice. My hope for you in 2021 is that you find the space, the energy, and the time to give becoming more deeply formed become what you do. As St. Paul hoped for the Galatians, so I hope for all of us this year that Christ may be formed in us. So as we start this year, and the happiest of New Year's to you, may his grace and peace be with you.